Sea of Thieves is one of the most perplexingly addictive games I have ever played. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about the game design techniques used by Rare to turn the fantasy of navigating and hunting on the high seas into a reality in this treasure hunting, swashbuckling, vitamin C deficient romance. Uh, so, spoiler warning from this point onwards, guys, and welcome to the anatomy of Sea of Thieves. Our journey follows you and a crew of like-minded pirates carving out your own story on these open waters. To voyage across this sea of thieves, to hunt down unsuspecting vessels, engage in commerce, or track down unimaginable treasure. Uh, anyway, uh, while playing this game, it is incredibly easy to sink a horrific amount of time into it. But why is this? What makes Sea of Thieves tick? Well, one of its greatest strengths is its mechanical simplicity and depth. To aid in making this game more accessible to new players, the act of control of the sails, helm and combat have been simplified to the nth degree. Uh, the nth degree is right here if you didn't know. A anyway, this might seem like a negative, but it's incredibly important. Just like we spoke about in the Anatomy of Hollow Knight episode, having simplified controls leads to mechanical mastery being achieved much quicker. And you can go watch that episode for a deeper dive into that topic, but to put it simply, the simpler the controls are, the faster the player can stop thinking about them and induce flow state. And yes, the mechanics may be really simple to pick up, but there's actually a lot of nuance in how you can actually control them. There's a really low skill floor to get into the game, but a really high skill ceiling due to the amount of decisions you have to make during gameplay. Like learning how to maximise your ship's speed by following the flow of the wind, or determining what types of cannonballs to use for each given situation, handbrake turning round rocks with the harpoons, or dropping anchor mid-pursuit to get enemy ships on the broadside. And all of this means that Gaining mechanical mastery is incredibly simple, but the nuance of its controls makes the skill gap between new and seasoned players feel meaningful and satisfying. And these mechanics aren't just designed to be fun and engaging, they also make you feel like a genuine pirate sailing these treacherous waters. And this is another one of Microsoft's scurvy simulator's greatest strengths, its endless diegetic mechanics. So for anyone who doesn't already know, I am a sound designer and I am incredibly passionate about sound's use in video games to help enhance the immersive quality of them and diegesis in its simplest form is a sound design term. When something is considered diegetic, it means it originates from inside of the game world itself. For example, the music being played by you and your crewmates is diegetic, but the music you hear when the skeleton ship spawns, well that is non-diegetic because it originates from outside of the game world. But diegesis can also be applied to gameplay mechanics. Does the mechanic itself originate from inside the game world? Would it make sense to the character that you're playing? For example, automatic regenerating health, well that's not diegetic, but having to scoff down food to heal yourself, that is diegetic. But why is this important? Well, the more we keep our mechanics diegetic to the game's world, the greater chance the player has of becoming immersed within it, because the player is never subconsciously asked to think of anything from outside of the world that they are currently playing in. And Sea of Thieves is a wonderful study of this, because every single mechanic from navigation puzzles to death are all diegetic. Yeah, yeah, come get out of the way, dude. Uh, to give you some examples, while navigating this pond of plungers, you have to do all of it via a map. No, 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 not this type of map, this type of map. And you have to do all of this navigation via compass, reading coordinates, or by looking at landmarks. Instead of the special events being signified to the player by markers on their map, they are written in the cloud. And once you've navigated your way to these islands, you have to locate the booty by solving riddles and referencing your treasure maps against landmarks and using your compass, meaning you actually have to look at and engage with your environment instead of just blindly staring at UI elements. This keeps the player in the game mentally and gives them such a great chance of becoming enveloped and immersed within it. Ugh, but the question is, why don't we see this more in games? Well, it's a lot more complex and time-consuming to develop systems that are diegetic to the game's world, compared to just plastering them on UI elements and just letting the player be. And the developers should be commended for the amount of detail they've poured into these designs. And these wonderfully detailed designs allow for the player to tell an incredible story through their own gameplay. But not just by themselves, every pirate captain needs a crew, so you'll need to find some trustworthy mates to help you tell these tall tales. 
So when you first play Splash of Illegal Resellers, you were given multiple options for what ship you would like to set sail in. A tiny sloop, a brigantine or a gigantic galleon, and each one of these ships becomes more complex to sail in than the last, with more cannons, more sails to manage, and more ground to cover to repair the ship if it's sinking. So you'll need a crew of mates to help you sail these beasts, one to be the helmsman to control the ship, riggers to manage the sails, cannoneers for combat, and a lookout crowboy. And while playing, it is incredibly easy to fall into these different roles and jobs, and this is encouraged with how crucial communication is while sailing effectively. Even the act of slowing the ship down is a team effort. Half sails, team. Half and all of this role play and communication leads to a lot of unique chances for Ludo Narrative. Uh, we spoke about Ludo Narrative in the Anatomy of Stardew Valley. Uh, play the clip editing, Jermaine. So instead of a conventional story which is delivered via text boxes or in-game events, the narrative is driven by the player's own actions in that environment, creating their own story from play. Yeah, 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 uh, cheers mate. You're welcome. Wait, what? What? Ah, oh, it's nothing mate. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, creating your own story as you set sail on these high seas, by yourself or with fellow crewmates, and these memorable moments can be altered by the tiniest details, like an enemy ship showing up on the shores of an island that you've spent so long tracking down. Or during a heated battle with another crew, one of their pesky players sneaks aboard with a bomb barrel, sabotaging your ship and turning the tide of battle. But there are far worse things than fellow pirates lurking beneath the sea of thieves. You'll spend more time fighting Mother Nature than fellow pirates, the megalodon stalking for its next meal, ghost ships rising from the depths looking for revenge, or the kraken looking to add another wreckage to the bedrock. And all of these events and micro changes constantly keep you on your toes and can completely change your game plan. Even finding rare loot like a weeping chest means your ship will slowly fill with salty chest tears if you don't constantly bail them out. And it's this variety of threats and events that can create many interesting and unique chances for Ludo Narratives. And in this ocean of illegitimate software downloaders, you really do have complete freedom to tell your own story. If you want to do nothing but hunt for treasure, you can do so and you'll be rewarded for it by the Gold Hoarder faction. PvP focused players are rewarded by the Reapers faction, PvE by the Order of Souls, and Commerce by the Merchants Alliance. No matter what you enjoy about the game, there is a faction for you can join to facilitate what you personally enjoy about the game. But every single thing you do in this game is in service of one thing. Gold. I love gold! Yes, gold. Everything you do from selling mermaid gems, discarded skulls of skeletal captains, or your entire hoard of treasure, you are always rewarded with gold. This is the game's main currency, and you can use this gold to buy new outfits for your pirate, new cosmetic customization options for your ship, or even buy new companions to join you along your journey, such as cats, dogs, and birds. Bird up. Hello. Uh, sorry to interrupt random fact of the day, uh, pirates actually used to keep a cat on board of their ship for the sole purpose of catching pesky stowaway rats that snuck aboard, but at the end of the day, having a bird just makes everything better. What do you think the B in bird stands for? I mean, yeah, that's right, carpentry, but that's besides the point. Back to the video. Because you choose what reward you would like to buy with your hard-earned gold, it means that this reward system has deterministic loot, rather than random loot. And the beauty of deterministic loot is that you can set your own extrinsic goals for what reward you personally want, and this keeps the player engaged. But one of the negatives of using deterministic loot systems is that once the player has acquired the cosmetics they want, they can be less incentivized to want to try and get more. And this is only really a problem because the entire loot system is based around cosmetics and not power gains. Wait, 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 I think the developers need to be commended for not including power gains or pay to win elements into their cash shop. Keeping everything cosmetic keeps the game balanced and fair, and I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. But this deterministic loot problem still exists. For example, if you have just spent upwards of one million dollars to acquire a ship skin, you are less incentivized to want to go and get another one to replace it. And that's not even to mention the cash shop. Replace one million gold with 20 pounds, and the same problem occurs. It just de-incentivizes the player to want to pursue gold and diminishes its entire value. Unless you're a completionist and you want to get all of the skins. 
but I would like to propose an alternate universe version of Sea of Thieves. Let's call it Wet of Tape. In this version, instead of deterministic loot, it also has a randomised loot system that runs alongside it. It's completely the same game, but cosmetics such as new weapons and pets can be found hidden around the world. Imagine finding a super rare jungle tiger hidden in the bush and you have to tame it. Now, why, why did I write this skit? Oh! This would make all of these things rare and exciting to run alongside this deterministic currency. So you can still get everything you want, but feel the excitement from stumbling across rare loot, which increases the player's drive to explore and keep playing the game. But at the end of the day, this is all personal preference. What do you prefer, deterministic or random? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to start a discussion with you and see what your point of view on this actually is. So what are my final thoughts on Sea of Thieves overall? Well, I think this game is stunning, not just visually, but in its audio and gameplay designs. So much love has been clearly poured into every inch of this game and it really shows. But it's not just a PvP pirate sim, it has so much more to offer, with the Tortell story mode to play through with your crew, arena modes and a complete open world. There is so much content that personally kept me and my crewmates coming back for more time and time again. Thank you so much to Vostia, Laxo and Dan McGrank for helping me film this episode. You're all wonderful. Thank you so much for watching guys. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. And the next episode on the channel is going to be the anatomy of Bloodborne. So look forward to that. And if you do enjoy this series and you want to support it further, please consider joining this wonderful team of people on Patreon. Thank you so much for the support guys. I'll see you in the next one.